So by way of introduction to our series of three videos, I just want to share with you some thoughts of what our objectives were. We're very eager to show how to physically examine the knee in the clinical setting. We wanted to show you some tricks, uh, display to you some pearls in terms of how to physically examine the person with arthritis, the individual that might have blown out their anterior cruciate ligament. And we start off with a retired school principal who has a relatively normal knee. We also wanted to emphasize the importance of the history prior to the physical examination. And I say that because the individual who's had a high energy injury, knee becomes puffy, that's a ligament problem. The person that's had a low energy injury and has some swelling and so on, that's a meniscus problem. And we'll talk about that as we display to you our three patients. They're all volunteers, they come with the good of their hearts, just to help us uh, help you. And I hope you enjoy these three videos. When I have a patient with knee difficulties and they come into clinic, the first thing that I will try and do is put them in a pair of shorts, even if you're a busy clinic, it really does help you in your analysis. And before I ask them to walk, I ask them to stand because that can bring out very subtle problems with knee difficulty. You look at their angulation, whether they're in varus or whether they're in valgus, knock knee or pole legged. Also, you want to look at the, the platform, the foot. Very commonly, we address the knee without looking at how the load is transmitted. And you can see with Mr. Tully, my friend, who's a retired school principal, he has a very high arched foot. And that type of foot transmits abnormal load to the knee because it's not very good at shock absorbing. So looking at Randy, he has excellent alignment otherwise. The other thing that I look at is to look at the vastus medialis because it's the, the muscle on the inside of the knee is the first one to vanish and the last one to come back. So if somebody has arthritis of the knee or has a meniscus problem or has blown out their ACL, the first thing that goes is the vastus medialis. And with Randy, you can see he has excellent alignment. He has the high arch foot. That's an athletic foot, I might add and he's got very good muscle mass. So the next thing I'd ask him to do briefly, and I know you're all gonna be in busy clinic, but this takes a couple of seconds just to get them to walk. And I'm gonna ask Randy just to walk towards me so I can see how he's moving. And then he's gonna turn around and go towards the camera. And you can see that his thrust is really quite normal. In people that have a bow-legged, position, they will have what we call a varus thrust, which really overloads the medial compartment. So Rand, you can go back and that's, that's great. So this is, a, this is a normal gait pattern in a fellow who's obviously very athletic. And the interesting thing is he has a high arch foot, which as a sidebar, it's a very rigid foot. So it does transmit significant load to the knee that a flat foot does not. So now I'm gonna ask him to sit on the end of the table and we'll look at other features of the knee exam. The first uh, component of the examination beyond looking at stance, looking at gait, is observation when the patient is sitting. And what you want to look for is everything from hair distribution, which means they've got a very good circulation. Then as you move up the tibia, you want to look at the knee itself. You want to see if there's any obvious swelling, you, and you, the way you determine that is if in fact you can see the bony contours. You want to see how the patella sits, whether it's straightforward, whether it's angled. You want to see evidence of old problems, for instance, oshkut schlatters disease, which you see in young athletes when the tibial tubercle becomes prominent. You want to also look at any calluses around the knee because people that are in carpentry, people that are carpet layers, etc., they have calluses on the knee and the patella, of course, doesn't like that. So observation is very important and as we talked about on the stance phase, you want to see how the muscle mass is. And to reiterate, the vastus medialis is critical because it's an index that tells you whether the knee is healthy or whether the knee is suffering. Once you've done that observation, before you even palpate the knee, you want to then move the patient back on the table so that they're in the supine position, and then you can go through a more aggressive examination. Backing up a little 
if in fact you want to look at range of motion at this point, that can be valuable. So I would ask uh, Randy just to take his good knee and give me full extension. And you can see that he is in nice extension. And that tells you that if there's any arthritic change, it is not very severe. He'll drop that back and we'll look at his other knee. And he's, got, he's a little bit timid about moving that knee as aggressively as the other, but he still has full extension. And if somebody has advanced arthritis in the knee, they lose extension. Even before you get a CT scan or an MRI, you know that there's some arthritic change in the joint. So that's, uh, that's extremely helpful. The other thing you might want to do is you want to move to palpation and in that position feel if there's any crepitus or crunching behind the kneecap. And so you just palpate the knee, ask the patient to stretch out, and you can feel there's a slight bit of crepitus within the knee and you know that's coming from the patellofemoral joint. And the same thing on the other knee. And with Randy he has more crunchiness on this side than the other side. And don't be perplexed by that because we did a study on first year medical students and about 60-65% of them had crepitus behind the patella. So that is not itself a, a very worrisome physical finding. The other thing you might want to do even now before you move the patient back in the examining table is just feel the temperature of the knee. And in medical schools they commonly teach you to do it with your back of your hand, but I don't find that for me nearly as sensitive as the palm of my hand to feel heat. And this knee is cool and this knee is cool. So if a joint is in trouble, whether it's meniscus, whether it's arthritis, uh, you will feel some heat within the joint and that's the telltale sign of having friction inside the knee. So you've felt the crepitus, you've observed whether there is any calluses on the knee, you've observed whether there's any residual Osgood slatters, and you've also felt for, crep uh, for not only crepitus but the heat within the joint then it's reasonable to move the patient back on the examining table. And remember, you're in a busy office and this has only taken you about seven or 10 minutes to do this examination so far. So once the patient has moved back on the examining table, again, the powers of observation can be extremely important. And with Mr. Tully, as he moves back, you can see that there's no obvious puffiness about the knee on either side. You can see, however, that there appears to be a little bit of muscle wasting on the left side compared to the right. It's really quite, um, quite minor, but it's gained, one of those very subtle findings. With the palpation, if in fact you want to move on to seeing if a knee is in trouble, the first thing that you do is palpate the tone of the actual quadricep. And in fact, in medical school back in the old days, they used to be, we were taught to use circumference and so on. That's not necessary. All you have to do is feel the tone and the tone. And you can see that this guy, to me, is decreased compared to the right side, which would tell me that Randy might have had a problem with his left knee in the past, being a very good athlete as he is. But again, I call that the blind man's test because you can look away, feel the tone and say that's normal and you say this is lesser than that guy. You might ask, well if somebody has a dominant leg, does the muscle become more toned than the opposite side? That's not, that's not true at all. The next thing you would like to do is take the liberty to examine the leg fully, check the pulses, pulses are bounding on both sides. You want to take a little bit of movement of the hip, just let it go loose for me, Ren. You just want to check the rotation of the hip and that takes you two and a half seconds and you know that he has normal hip joints. The other thing you would like to do, and, and I know you've been taught this in physio school and medical school, always examine the normal side first. If somebody has an injury to a knee, might have an ACL, go to the normal knee first so that you can truly see their normal physiologic laxity of the joint because young females are much more supple than males are and they are much looser joints as a, as a consequence and it'll really help your findings. So go to the normal extremity first. The other pearl with that is the fact the patient will trust you because they trust your hands, they know what you're going to do to their injured extremity. So with Randy I would quickly feel his collaterals, nice and loose for me Rand. Collaterals, we do that at 30 degrees of, of flexion. No, he's straightening out. I'm having, he's fighting me a bit, so I just have to get him to relax. And then I'll check his anterior cruciate. 
I will do a Lockman maneuver and I'll show you that in a little more detail when I go to his other knee. And then in fact I will do his drawer, which is anterior drawer and posterior drawer. And again, as we move on to pathology, I'll explain the, the sensitivity of those particular tests. So in summary, with Mr. Tully, he has a normal right leg, normal muscle tone, some subpatellar crepus, crepitus, which is physiologic for him, normal hip, and normal ankle, and a high arch foot, which is the athletic foot. So this is a normal extremity. I'll now move over to his other side, which is likewise normal, but tells me that he's probably had an old injury to that knee, and I can tell by the tone of, of his muscle. So as we have talked about with uh, Randy's uh, right knee, which is completely normal, excellent range of motion, some subpatellar crepitus, excellent muscle mass, very good alignment, normal hip, and a pes cavus foot, which is a high arch foot, as we talked about. Let's go to his left knee, which is likewise normal, and as an active fellow and over the age of 50, he's likely to have some early medial compartment uh, OA or arthritis, which happens with, uh, with aging, with athletic activity, but we won't dwell on that. What I want to do is demonstrate some physical tests that will help you as it relates to knees that you see in your clinic that have been hurt. The first thing that we talked about is range of motion. Anybody that has a full extension is not in trouble. When in fact there is lack of full extension in people over the age of 50, you know that it's compatible usually with a little bit of medial compartment arthritis. The other thing you want to do with the knee and extension is to feel for any warmth, which we talked about earlier. And Randy's knee is really quite cool, but heat within a joint will tell you that there's something intra-articular that's giving you friction. The other thing you want to do as you feel for fluid, etc., is they talk about the patella balotment test. I don't find that very helpful. I think that if merely with your two hands using the front palms of your hand, which we talked about earlier, you can feel if there's any fluid in the joint or if there's any thickening of the lining of the joint, the synovium. The other thing you want to do with palpation is you want to feel for areas of point tenderness. And if in fact you have a meniscus problem in 99% of people, the tenderness will be along the joint line. They talk about the Apley maneuver, McMurray maneuver and so on. The sensitivity of those maneuvers, which I'll show you, is only about 20%. So I hardly ever use them and I hardly ever teach them anymore. It's joint line tenderness that will tell you whether somebody has torn a meniscus. And that's sensitive in about 90% of cases. With Randy being over the age of 50 and being athletic, he has a little bit of lipping on the actual femur and the tibia, and that was described by Fairbanks back in 1946. And that's a squaring phenomenon, and that's just a reflection of wear. Just like your skin ages, your cartilage ages as well. So McMurray, up, flex, rotate as you're loading the joint and try and catch the meniscus. McMurray published that back in the 30s, and in fact, it's very nonspecific, and in fact, with Randy, it's negative. So it's a matter of loading the joint, rotating under flexion, and trying to catch the meniscus. The Apley test described by Graham Apley is when they're on their face and you're loading the joint. The actual stand and load test, etc., is is a, a version of that, and I don't find them very helpful at all. If somebody has a history of a ligament injury, you want to go through your ligament testing. And I'll show you how to do that. When in fact the knee is in full extension, your capsule is tight, so you can't possibly test your ligaments, either your medial collateral or your lateral collateral when the knee is in full extension, because those ligaments or the capsule is too tight. You want to flex them to 30 degrees. Now the posterior capsule is loose, and now you can feel whether there's any pathological laxity, valgus maneuver, varus maneuver, etc. Put the knee at 30 degrees of flexion. That will test your collaterals. The other thing you want to look at is your cruciate, and this drives people crazy. If in fact somebody has blown out their, like, their posterior cruciate ligament, and you've known some very good athletes that have done that as of late, there is always a posterior drawer maneuver. You want to determine that by putting your fingers on the femoral condyle with the knee at 90 degrees 
and pushing the tibia backwards. Sometimes if a person has nasty posterior cruciate, you can go loose, has turned the, hurt their posterior cruciate as well as collaterals, the tibia will sag back on the tibia. Such is not the case um, in most individuals with a posterior cruciate tear, it'll be the posterior drawer maneuver. And that'll fool you. So that's why you want to ch check the normal knee first, etc. Now the anterior drawer. If the anterior cruciate ligament is completely torn and the injury is chronic, then you will get an anterior drawer maneuver by putting your thumbs on the femoral condyle and putting an anterior drawer pull on the tibia with the patient relaxed. A couple of tips. Do not do it if the patient's anxious because in fact their hamstrings will become tight and it'll block that maneuver. So you want to do it on the normal knee so you get the patient's trust and then do it on this side. It is only positive in about 50% of cases if somebody has blown out their ACL. If in fact you want to get a more specific test, you put the knee down at 30 degrees and then you do your anterior drawer, which is a so-called Lockman maneuver. It has a sensitivity of about 100%. So don't be, don't be buffooned if in fact, or, or bothered if in fact you do the anterior drawer and it's normal. Put them down to 30 degrees and then do your Lockman maneuver at that point. Very helpful and in fact has a sensitivity that's extremely high and you won't miss any. As far as the patellofemoral joint is concerned, when you get somebody that's over 40, they will not have patella instability. So in fact, if you're doing an apprehension maneuver with the knee at 30 degrees and pulling the patella laterally, all of us don't like that. But that is not a very specific test. You'll get patella instability in people that are under the age of 20, maybe 25. They will have a distinct apprehension maneuver as you have the knee at 30 degrees and put lateral pressure on the patella. But remember, most people have patellofemoral crepitus, which we determined in our studies, which we did back in the 80s. Carson is a 17-year-old hockey player, delightful young man that presents to clinic complaining of knee pain after he got hurt playing hockey and we'll get him to talk to you in a second, but what I'm gonna do first, as he comes into clinic, I put him in a pair of shorts, make him as comfortable as possible. He's with his mom, who's a lovely lady, who puts him at ease, and I say to you as practitioners, don't hesitate to have the loved ones in the cubicle because it makes the patient feel much more comfortable. Then what I would do is once I've stripped him down, shoes and socks off, I want to see how he walks. So I want you to turn and face me first, Cars. Good, and that's very good because whether you look at him from behind or in front, you can see that he's built like an athlete. He has genuvarus, which is bow legness, which is extremely common in very good athletes, whether they're soccer players, whether they're hockey players. You cannot, uh, this is fundamental to being able to execute your sport as you're built like Carson is. You also can see that he has a high arch foot, so-called pescavus foot, and that too is a very athletic foot because it's a fast foot. So just as a sidebar, whenever you have somebody with a knee problem, don't just focus on the knee. Look at their hips, look at their feet, look at their foot plant. And even if you're in a busy office, it's important that you do that. It takes you about two seconds, but it gives you all sorts of, uh, all sorts of information. When I see him, I can see that one muscle mass is bigger than the other, which tells me that he might have had an injury to his right knee. And that's assuming that I know nothing about this young man. I can just tell by looking at the vastus medialis, his quad, is a little bit shut down on one side compared to the other. Also on observation, I can talk myself in the fact there's a little bit fullness around the knee compared to the opposite side. In other words, right knee in contrast to left. And even if I didn't know anything about him, that would be my observation at this point. What I want you to do, young Carson, is I want you to walk to me, and then I want you to turn around and walk towards Cameron. Do it nice and slow so we can see any abnormality in your gait. We call this an adductor thrust. 
which is in fact what happens when he loads and when he's sprinting. If we had high speed film, this type of varus deformity would become even more exaggerated. So the gait can tell you whether it's a short leg gait, whether it's an antalgic gait from pain. Just watch the way his patella tracks as well. Young Carson, as we talked about, is a 17-year-old that was playing hockey and, and pivoted awkwardly and not to steal his thunder, but hurt his knee in a very significant way with that rotational thrust. And when I asked him uh, how quickly the knee became puffy, he said, Doc, when I got my gear off, etc., which as you know is within about 20 minutes, his knee was as big as a house. And that's important from a, a history standpoint because you know when somebody gets um, a puffy knee that quickly, it's probably blood and rather than effusion. So right away as a physio or as a doc, the alarm flag goes up because you think that something inside the knee has bled. And that is usually a ligament and in sometimes it can be what we call an osteochondral injury where the joint surface gets battered. So right away before I even proceed with a physical examination, I want Carson and his mum to know that I, I am concerned. The key thing then with the physical examination, once you've had him walk, you see his, his gait, um, and he would tell you right now that he's feeling much better and he's several, not several weeks, but he's some weeks from the time of injury and he's starting to feel, as a 17 year old would, much better, much more secure with the leg. When in fact I've walked him, now I sit him, I want to look at the bony contours. And one can see that on the right side, the bony contours are pretty good, but not as vivid as they are on the left side, which tells me that he probably has some swelling inside the knee that's remaining. The other thing that I'll do at this stage, he's young, he's 17, I don't have to worry about his circulation, etc. I will really then move on to seeing his range of motion because when somebody has been hurt significantly they will they will lose full extension so Cars, do me a favor fully extend your left knee that's it Str out straight so he's got normal range of motion he doesn't have the bendy back knees which are recurvatum that you see in young women because they become hyperextensible and that's a different story because if they have hurt an injury then the surgery for that is much more difficult bring it down for me son show me the range of motion in that guy so good, but not the same rhythm as he has on the other side, and drop it down for me. The other observa observation I'd make at this point is his patella tracking seems to be really quite good, uh, quite normal for sure. So even in the sitting position, you're in a busy office, you want to find out which knee is in trouble, you'll feel for any heat in the knee. And there's no question this guy is cool as a cucumber and this guy is warm. So right away, even if he wouldn't use his words, I know this is the injured knee, for sure, just by the, the temperature. Also, I'll get a feel for the lining of the joint, the so-called synovium, and this guy is thicker than this guy, which tells me, once again, that this is the injured knee, and the synovium becomes inflamed and thick as it's trying to resorb either the fluid or the blood that was in the joint before. Now what I will do at this stage is I'll put him back on the examining table and I will go to his good knee because I want to get his trust and I want him to feel that I'm not going to hurt him and so on. And sometimes when you have students in the clinic like I do on a regular basis, I want him to feel that he's not being manhandled. Just sit back for me. Come on. So as I mentioned with, uh, in the past, the key thing is to examine the normal knee first so that you can feel normal range of motion, etc. how rhythmical it is. You want to test the muscle mass, normal tone, tone not as good as this side. And again, I call that the blind man's test because I know this is the injured extremity when in fact there's atrophy. And Carson has been on a rehab program working crazy on his muscle mass, but it's just not back to where his left side is. The other thing that I want to examine at this point, having determined that this guy is warmer than this, the quad is not as toned as this side, then I want to take the liberty of examining his hips, and he's a young guy, so I know his hips are gonna be normal. Internal rotation is perfect, so I know it's very unlikely that he has any major hip disease. 
The other thing that I want to do at this stage is I want to feel his normal ligaments. And he's 17, he's male, and his ligaments are really very, very strong, very tight. He doesn't have any physiologic laxity. Now, once I've got his trust or achieved his trust, I want to go to his injured extremity. Just before I do that, I want to go back to what we talked about earlier with his, and if I suspect there's a ligament injury, I want to check his ACL. We can do that with a drawer test, which I told you has only a sensitivity of about 50%. His posterior drawer is fine, and I want to do the Lachman maneuver at 30 degrees, and he is snug. And I say that only because I want to do this exact same test on this side. He does not have any meniscus problem, so he doesn't have any joint line tenderness. I haven't abandoned the McMurray and the Apley test, but I don't find they give me the yield that I want in terms of meniscal testing. It really comes down to joint line tenderness. So what I would like to do now is move over to his injured right knee. So going to his uh, injured right knee, right leg, Again, I'll examine the range of motion of the hip, which is normal, foot and ankle normal, high arch foot, athletic foot, varus alignment, which is normal for, for Carson. So the key thing I want to do now is I want to test his ligaments. He still has a little bit of warmth in the joint. The lining of the joint is a little bit thick. There's no fluid. I blot the patella. There's no fluid inside the joint. There is no Baker cyst. What I will do, as I mentioned before, with full extension, you can't check the collaterals because the posterior capsule is tight. So I would move him to 15 degrees and I would examine his medial collateral. If anything, it may be a little bit, a little bit looser than his other side, but not dramatic. And when I'm at 30 degrees, I do the varus maneuver to check the lateral collateral. And again, it's pretty snug. I will then move into the anterior drawer, and not to diss that test, but don't hang your hat on it, because if somebody's hurt the anterior cruciate, it can be negative in 50% of cases. Why? Because the collaterals become snug, and the menisci move in behind the femur. So I'll test him, and he's really quite normal. I will internally rotate him, he's normal. I will externally rotate him, and he's normal and his posterior drawer is normal. So if I want then to really, really test individually or in a singular fashion the ACL, I'll move him down to 30 degrees and then I will do what I call the Lockman maneuver. And you can see how subtly positive that is compared to his other side. For my students, when I teach them, they have difficulty feeling that, so I call that the divot test. Whenever you can get rid of the, the swale between the tibial tubercle and the patella and it flattens out on you and it gets rid of that divot, that's to, for me in terms of teaching students and so on, I find it visually much more appealing to them than trying to feel that subtle laxity. And with Carson, there's just the mildest form of a positive Lachman and a positive divot test. So that makes me suspect that perhaps he's injured when he had this rotational injury and his knee became very puffy, that he's hurt his anterior cruciate ligament. So he doesn't have any joint line tenderness. He doesn't either medial or lateral. Um, his aptly maneuver, which we talked about trying to catch the meniscus, is negative. But that is really no surprise. So at this stage, taking this delightful young 17-year-old who had a high energy injury, knee became very puffy, quad shut down, etc. Um, I think he's hurt his anterior cruciate ligament. And now we can talk very briefly about some treatment options. He's waiting for his MRI to demonstrate to us whether it's a partial or whether it's a complete tear. And then we can talk to he and his parents in terms of what the treatment options are hereafter. Mr. Riley is a friend of mine and he's 87 years of age if you can believe it and he has arthritis of both knees that we have been treating non-surgically and he's ex doing extremely well. He's an avid golfer and, and walker and really should be 
should be as an example for all of us in terms of what to do as we move on beyond our sixth decade in terms of keeping our weight down and our exercise up. And we have been able to keep him under control with his exercise, uh, which he's a great advocate of. And also we use a Duralane, a visco supplement, to try and keep his knees oiled, which have proved very effective for him. And we'll talk about that later. As part of the first examination, when this type of Mr. Riley comes to your clinic, is a gain. Put them in the stance phase, have them walk for you, see in fact how their muscle recruitment is, and how the knee is aligning as they walk. So, Mr. R, if you don't mind, if you could walk towards Cameron, that would be great. And you can see that his gait pattern is really quite excellent. His alignment, there is no varus valgus thrust, and he's just gonna do that a few times for us as we can see how the tibia stays under the femur, how the patella tracks nicely, and watch his foot plant. He has a very young foot. His arch is really quite adequate in terms of not needing any type of treatment. He's not an exaggerated flat-footedness or high-arched positioning. And the, also the interesting thing is his muscle mass is really quite excellent. So what I'm gonna ask here is you, if you would sit just on the corner of the table, if you don't mind. So with a patient like Mr. Riley, who is, as we mentioned, uh, 80 plus and is extremely active, when I do a physical examination on him, I'm very heartened by what I see. Number one, look at the entire patient. He's kept his body weight down. He's kept his activities levels up. He has got very good muscle mass for somebody who in fact is over 60. He has excellent alignment. On observation, I don't see any swelling or effusion of either knee. His bony contours are fine. He has a little bit of residual Oshgood Schlatter's disease there, which implies to me that he's been very active over the years. Always when you have somebody over 60 that's a non-diabetic, you still want to look for their circulation, make sure that their pulses are normal. And if you're in a busy office, if somebody has good hair distribution, you know their circulation is just fine. The first thing that I will do before I put my hands on such a patient is number one, get them to show me how much extension they have of the knee. So he has full extension. So right away, your alarm flag goes down because you know if they have any arthritic change in the knee, it's still nicely under control and is not severe or operative. The other side, two for me, Jer, full range of motion. So before you go to, and down, before you go to CT scan x-rays or MRIs, you know full well that this gentleman is truly operational in the sense that he is not even close to being a surgical candidate. Once I put him back on the, on the examining table and examine him more carefully, let me digress a moment and say when you have people that have some wear of the knee joint, call it arthritis, because people get freaked out when you use those terms. So just say, listen, your skin ages and your cartilage ages. That puts their mind at ease. And if in fact somebody has discomfort, etc., you want to get their weight down, you want to get their muscle mass up, and both those papers were published in 1983, they might want to use a knee brace that they would use when they're playing 18 holes of golf, or if they have a chance to play 36, or if they want to ride in the cart nine holes and then walk nine holes, then they'd use a, a knee brace made by a reputable company. And some people get bothered by thinking of a big harness on their knee, and there's many, many sophisticated soft braces that will give them the support and comfort that they need. If in fact a patient presents with a really puffy knee that's swollen and angry and so on, rather than using a medication by mouth, why not use a shot of corticosteroid, just a small shot of, of um, uh, prednisone or a shot of, of depomedrol that will get them under control. That makes more sense to me than something that goes by mouth through their guts and kidney and livers and so on. So don't hesitate to use a corticosteroid injection. If in fact somebody like Mr. Riley has a dry knee that bothers him and so on, he presents, listen, I've tried this and that, but I'm still uncomfortable, then to use one of those visco supplements can help. We did the research on it. The results are a bit mixed, but uh, Gerald seems to get very good relief from it. 
But again, it doesn't get rid of the arthritic uh, change. It's really a matter of uh, giving him a lubricant and um, that will sometimes give them an extended period of time of comfort. So if you would just sit back there, kind sir. Going back to what I said earlier, I always look for alignment, even when they're in the, uh, the sitting or, or lying position. And with Mr. Riley, you can see that he's got very straight legs, no abnormal angles, varus and valgus. The bony contours look absolutely fine. I don't see any puffiness. His circular, just on, on quick visualization, his uh, perfusion circulation is fine. I will then go to quick palpation. I'll check his pulses, which are those of a 17-year-old. I'll quickly move the hip, and if, in fact, I have rhythmical movement, internal rotation, I can put my mind at ease that there is no, there's no evidence of any badness in the hips themselves. I will then ask him to bend, and you can see he's got flexion of somebody who's very youthful and what happens when when somebody has advanced arthritis they do lose range of motion not only in flexion but in full extension or vice versa then I'll put my hands on them no increase in heat so these are quiet joints there's no evidence of thickness of the synovium there's no fluid and there's no evidence of any inflammation in the joint whatsoever he has not had a history of any ligament injury, but if he did, I would just quickly, nice and loose for me, Jerry, I'm just gonna wiggle you. I would check the ligaments to make sure that they are solid. And again, in a busy office, without a history of trauma, you know his ligaments are gonna be absolutely fine. The tone of his muscle is compatible with his age. They're symmetrical, one and the other are equal. So if we fast forward with this very fine gentleman that wants to stay active, I would try and stay away from any medications other than perhaps some natural things like fish oils, which have been shown to be helpful for cartilage. If in fact a knee becomes painful and he's on the verge of needing an operation, I would then go to a visco supplement with a brace and um, the brace to be used intermittently when he is doing his activities or say he's going through a bad week and he wants to continue to play with his buddies and so on. I'd ask him to use the brace and then wean himself off it because they feel so comfortable that people can sometimes become dependent on it. With Mr. Riley, we've chosen to inject his left knee today. With the visco supplementation, we used to be able to get six months out of it, and that becomes somewhat short, and that's normally the case with people. You also want to let the patient know that this doesn't get rid of the arthritic problem or the degeneration. It merely smooths it out. It's like an oil to give them some, some relief and in an attempt to keep them away from knee replacement or a big operation of any type. In terms of injecting joints, I teach my young students not to be frightened of injecting joints, particularly knee, rotator cuff, and so on. Anytime you're injecting around an area that has a poor blood supply, like the Achilles tendon or like the patellar tendon, you want to be somewhat more cautious. In terms of the knee joint for injecting, the bony landmarks are easy. There's your patella. There's your patellar tendon. There's your tibial tray there. There's the femoral condyle. Now you have the option of injecting infrapatellar, but then you're wrestling with the fat pad. You have the in option of injecting laterally, which is here, which some of my colleagues do, etc. I choose the medial side for no particular reason other than the fact that's what I teach, that's what I've had good luck with in the past, etc the chances of being in the joint, et cetera, to, in my experience, even with unskilled hands, is, is the highest when you go from the medial side. The soft spot is just below the patella, the upper one-third here, and there's a soft spot here. Now the key thing is when you're just doing this for the, just getting skilled at this, don't hesitate to use lots of freezing. I use 2% xylocaine without adrenaline. You want to flood the area so that the patient feels very comfortable, etc. The part of the injection that is uncomfortable is the skin and the capsule. So don't hesitate to use lots of uh, freezing before you inject the, the material. The other thing that I sometimes do is use a little ethyl chloride, which is a bit of local freezing. 
it's sterile and you just as you're preparing your material just just freeze that area with a little ethyl chloride you can use a little alcohol swab if you want I tend to use a little bit of betadine or bridine just to make sure the area is really sterile and that's just another little protection it's not absolutely mandatory it's just something that I do and it's messy and all of that stuff but it really is to, in my experience the best prep the chances of getting an infection or a complication from this type of prep is extremely low maybe because I'm in a teaching center and I just want to be an example for my young colleagues that I'm doing everything possible to keep the area as sterile as possible but it's not essential if somebody has hepatitis, if somebody's HIV positive, that's a different story. You want to be a little bit cautious for them and for yourself. With my freezing is I'll keep it in a syringe of five cc's, 2% xylocaine, and I'll clean all this betadine up once I'm finished. And then use a 25 gauge needle and you just a really gentle in terms of anesthetizing the skin create a little bit of a wheel which is a little bit of because the skin as I mentioned is the sensitive part of it and then you gradually give the patient give the patient time let it set up don't be in a rush and just gradually progressively go down to the joint itself and once you're in the joint you can feel it and you let the you let the needle sit there and I'll tell you why it just tells you the line of where you've penetrated the joint and the patients are fine they don't freak over that at all just leave it in position for a millisecond and you have to use a larger needle because the material itself is very viscous it's very thick so you have to use an 18 gauge needle to finish the job and then you're all done. And you ask the patient just to swirl it around a little bit because he'll feel in there it'll gurgle a little bit. And there we go, Jer. That's great, and I'll clean you all up. Be cautious with your needles. Make sure that when you put them back in their sheath that it's nice and secure. And when you're around people, dispose of them very, very cautiously. So Mr. Riley now has had the um, Visco supplement, the Duralane, and I will certainly advise him that it's important to ice it tonight and tomorrow too, just because of some inflammation that may ensue, etc. He may in fact need a little Tylenol tonight to hold him, but that's pretty unusual. The ice is, is really where you want to go. Also, in combination with the injection, whether it's a cortisone shot or in this case, visco supplementation, a small compressive knee brace can be very helpful. Uh, number one, in making the patient comfortable, giving the patient uh, an enhanced feeling of security. And in fact, once they get back to their robust activities, whether it's walking or golf or a combination of both, then to use their supportive knee brace. Sometimes it, it's so comfortable they become dependent on it so I encourage them when they get their muscle mass back and the knee quiets down to use it intermittently during days of of inflammation or uh, enhanced stress if they're going for a long walk and, and uh, perhaps a bike ride. So Rob, as we did this morning, we had patients with a variety of, of issues and you being the expert in bracing, how would you handle the 80 year old golfer who has an osteoarthritic knee, doesn't want an operation, very eager to try every technique to 
provide him with the stability and comfort while he plays his 18 holes. Can you give us some advice in terms of what you'd suggest? Absolutely. I think, uh, like you said, you look at the history and then find out what the patient's activity is. And also looking at the leg is important as well. If you still have somewhat of a, a, a decent athletic limb, you have more options, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Some patients, uh, especially maybe more aggressive that were in that condition but were still very much uh, hiking or golfing, as you say, they might look to a framed unloader brace, this style of product. Uh, however, this patient selection for this product sometimes is a little more limited, again, depending upon the patient. And one that we could also look to that we find a bit better compliance with is sort of a hybrid. So it involves a rigid component for the uh, unloading component, but it also includes a, a very neat knit sleeve that is quite comfortable to wear. It, it, it also is better at dispersing pressure. If you have, mm -hmm. you know, as we know, we look at the surface area and if you have a lot of force there that can create pressure points. This one sort of spreads it across the limb and, and helps to eliminate uh, pressure points. The key thing on this brace is that uh, unlike some of the other rigid orthosis that can contain a lot of straps, this just adjusts at one point. Mm -hmm. And if the patient's having a tougher day, perhaps uh, the OA is bugging them a little more, or if in fact uh, they're walking as they're golfing and maybe just putting a little more stress on the knee, mm -hmm. uh, this one, you, the patient can adjust and sort of let pain be their guide. So they're having a little more trouble, they can snug it down a little more and get a better active offloading effect. So that's one, uh, speaking of um, the patient that you asked me about, I would think a product like this would be very, very good for that type of patient. Uh, and um, overall, we, we see it fit a wider range of gotcha. the osteoarthritic leg. Gotcha. Now, this particular patient was fitted with one of these braces and he found it extremely comfortable. And he wanted to have something that, was, that he could use on his daily activities, etc., and not just for his, for his golfing. Would you, would you allow him to do that or would you go with a, uh, a different type of brace? Well, if I had to sort of uh, select a catch-all in, in his particular case, I probably would suggest the, the uh, Genutrain OA. Right. However, that's a very good point. When we look to the Genutrain, which, was, which is really our, our, our foundation of all of these products in, in knit-type bracing or hybrid-type bracing, this is definitely one that you can wear for lighter activity, yeah, yeah. Yeah. even sometimes after they come back from golfing and they're experiencing a little swelling or, or pain and they're just sort of resting, it's a great product to put on for a few hours, get the swelling down and help to reduce the pain as well, just sort of get range of motion back. Uh, if in fact they've uh, you know noticed that it's you know, sort of seizing up. Can a I have bit. a look at that brace? Absolutely. Yes, and, and the patient compliance, in my experience with this type of brace, has been really quite exceptional. It breathes nicely, yes. if there's no odor to it, etc. And uh, patients really, if they're going to a cocktail party, want to put it under their slacks, they really uh, embrace this type of, of soft knit brace. Absolutely, and despite having over 40 studies on this product, it, this is the eighth generation of it, and we've learned a little more as we go, it was developed by a physician and Mr. Bauerfein back in the late 70s. Um, but the, the thing about it is having a lot, obviously we need evidence-based medicine as we, you know, we listen to in industry and then try to accommodate with products that make sense for their patients. But that's a very good point you raise is patient compliance. Yeah. Patient compliance is key and I've uh, seen other types of product go on patients and in a couple of weeks they go non-compliant mm -hmm. and, and it can be a significant yeah, waste and, and, and yeah. nobody really wins in that case. So this brace, despite it's for sort of more mild indications, uh, sometimes if you have a ligament sprain or mild OA, it's a great product for that. But I've seen people, you know, further along the stages of OA, of OA maybe three or four, that still use this yeah. in part and parcel maybe with a, an offloader or in fact just on its own for pain management. Yeah. I've seen it and, and the compliance is, is really quite impressive. Pivoting to the young man the, who in fact blew out his anterior cruciate ligament mm -hmm. and we're concerned as are the parents that he may in fact require an operation 
as we were able to demonstrate on the video, the ACL is, is deficient. Mm -hmm. And he's wanting to try a non-surgical program. Right. He would like to try and get back to his hockey, um, perhaps avoiding an anterior cruciate reconstruction. Do you have some suggestions in terms of brace for that young man? Yeah, absolutely. You can always look to, uh, you know, something with more passive stability, like a rigid framed orthosis. But what I find a lot of times with athletic patients, um, they, they're looking for something that offers maybe a bit more. And this is a brace that we use more so for the, our athletic population if in fact, in, as in his case, was ACL uh, deficient mm -hmm. or PCL. This brace incorporates, again, it's a bit of a hybrid. We have two uh, rigid uh, hinges that uh, are, you know, are positioned medially and laterally. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of neat adjustments on the hinges that can find their point of axis of rotation independently, medium, laterally as well. But it still incorporates, the neat thing about it, that this is a very neat knit. Um, it's a specialized knit. And if you can see here, what in fact it, it, it mimics is your basic four point principle in that we use these two pieces of material on the anterior thigh and the posterior calf to really replace a rigid bar. Mm -hmm. So if you think of an active patient and sometimes, especially in, ho in, in his case, he's being a hockey player, a lot of time a very developed quad. Yes, yes. And when, when that quad fires and when it relaxes, a rigid bar can sometimes create pressure points on the leg. And this one absorbs, the neat thing about it um, you can stretch it uh, vertically and diagonally, but medial to lateral, it withstands 180 kilograms of pressure. Mm -hmm. So it acts, in fact, functionally as a rigid component, right. but moves with the leg. And if this young man then undergoes an anterior cruciate surgical reconstruction, do you recommend that brace as a post-operative brace as well, or do you have another idea? Yeah, in, in post-operative, uh, as, as, you know, it certainly depends upon uh, the, the situation and yes. the surgeon's call for sure. Uh, this one would be one they could use after the surgery, yes, but not no, not while the, the patient was stitched or anything like that. Right. You might yes. you might go to a range of motion yes. product and ease them back into mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But then, yes, after that is done, you certainly can. Gotcha. As they return to action. Exactly. Thanks very yes. much.